thank you very much to you, Ellen, and uh, thank you very much to Hope, because really, I think, uh, helping us to, to meet, to, to be together, that was here in Marseille, uh, uh, three years ago and today in London is, is extremely important. Each time that's uh, refueling us and uh, uh, helping us a lot having this connection and exchanges uh, of information, that's extremely useful, I think. Um, I would like just to insist on one point due to discussions yesterday, which is related to the fact that even if uh, uh, Helen is nice enough to consider him the champion of radio surgery, um, I'm not only doing radio surgery, and actually what we do have in our hands in terms of weapons for HH. We, we do brachytherapy, but we, have we are not doing for HH, but we, we do it for tumors. So we can do it if we want. Um, we, iodine re uh, brachytherapy, we, we, we do um, terrional approach, uh, 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 disconnections. We do uh, uh, transcalosal interfunicial approaches. Uh, endoscopy. The only thing we don't do yet is visual aids, but uh, as I was saying a few minutes ago, we, we plan to be one of the first uh, center in Europe equipped, and we hope we will start soon, and we will have the opportunity to, uh, to evaluate uh, uh, this. Um, about radio surgery, we started in the early 90s to use radio surgery in a certain number of epilepsies, and especially mesotemporal of epilepsies, and that was uh, 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 an opportunity to demonstrate through ser a series of papers and works the safety efficacy of radio surgery. And this is a paper in neurology uh, demonstrating the long term, long term safety efficacy of radio surgery in basal temporal lobe epilepsy with our neurologist Fabrice Bartolome. Um, in the 2000, uh, the, the, the conception was that uh, 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 people were understanding we can alleviate the, the epilepsy by targeting the amatoma. Um, the first surgical experience was very negative, in, and that was published very honestly by Palmini, in the sense that some of the patients were cured, but the, the mor morbidity was very high, and the efficacy uh, was uh, partial. Um, I got at this time the idea to look at few rare cases of amatoma treated around the world and publish the first series of amatoma in 2000 in neurosurgery. Actually, in this series, only one was from Marseille, and one from Tokyo, one from uh, US, and that was a small series. And this small series uh, gave us really the feeling that that was worth working more with radio surgery to see what can be done, because that was turning out to be very safe in this short retrospective study. And we uh, uh, organized at this time something much more ambitious, which was to try to have a prospective trial. And because this is a very se severe disease, but very rare disease, uh, that was quite a big effort. Um, our total cohort is 105 patients operated, and 48 patients were re retained in this uh, uh, trial. Here you have the, the criteria for inclusion and exclusion of this uh, trial. That was a prospective trial uh, declared under the control of the health authorities. And that's, as far as I know nowadays, the only uh, 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 trial in the field of uh, HH surgery. And I think we need to have more of these for other techniques. So very rapidly, of course, what we were doing was to pay attention to seizures before no psychological testing, psychiatric evaluation, endocrinological evaluation, visual field and acuity evaluation, and MRIs um, every three or six months. And we have tried really to have as much as possible a minimum of follow-up of three years for all the patients. That was not always easy because a lot of these patients were coming from abroad, from South America or New Zealand, and uh, that was really tough sometimes. Um, I will not go in all the detail of the demographic. That's just the population, which is mixed of adults and children, with a high representation of uh, comorbidity, with psychiatric comorbidity, hyperkinesia, hyperaggressivity, autistic features, cognitive uh, comorbidity. Um, Nothing special. Uh, the, the anatomy of the amatoma is special in the sense that we were not treating every kind of amatoma, and this is maybe the more important point to keep in mind. We were treating the, the one in the hypothalamus or in the third or in the floor or uh, above the floor. But the, the, make, the big majority that was the three first stages uh, in the classification we, we use. 
And some of these patients, 8%, were in the frame of a Pallister Hall uh, uh, syndrome. As you can see here, the vast majority of these hematoma were of, of small size. Uh, and that's a very important uh, uh, feature. From a radiosurgical point of view, the only thing I'm, I may indicate is that we are much less aggressive compared to brachytherapy in terms of dosage, which is a choice. Uh, we favor being less aggressive, and we always tell patients, if the result is good but partial, we will go for second radiosurgery. We, pre we prefer to, to stage it than to, to be more aggressive initially, taking the risk to have a, a toxicity. I think this is making sense, and this is coming from the first uh, paper, the retrospective paper, because in this paper, several of the patients were treated twice with a good effect uh, on both the first and the second uh, uh, stage. When you look at the average outcome on the long term, and please pay attention to the fact that in the literature there is a lot of papers with six-month follow-up, and this is completely biased. As long as you don't have one or two years of follow-up, this is completely overestimating the quality of the results. But these are long-term follow-up. When you look at it, if you look at angle one and two, we are at 62% of patients who are uh, uh, almost seizure-free. Uh, I, I will repeat the one thing several times, certainly, which is that in this group of patients, I don't think the efficacy must be evaluated only on the seizure freedom. I don't think it is a pertinent criterion because the, the major problem is the comorbidity, the psychiatric and the cognitive comorbidity. If you have patients having experiencing hundreds of seizures a day with huge psychiatric and uh, um, uh, cognitive comorbidity, and after several months, you have every six months a gelastic fit, and they go back to school, and they, they, they have better attention, and they stop to have rages, uh, that's a fantastic result. You don't have to say, oh, that's a bad result because there is still one gelastic fit every six months. That, that doesn't make sense. So that's the reason why I feel authorized to put one and two together, even if I don't do it for MTD, if you take another example. Interestingly, Yes, the disadvantage of radio surgery is that this is taking months. Maybe it is because it is taking months that this will turn out to be very safe also. But what is interesting, in spite of the delayed effect, is that if you look at the, the types of seizures the patient can present with, you see that the secondary generalized tonical uh, clinic seizures are those who are usually starting to disappear first, which are the more severe and the more disabling. And those who are taking more time are the gelastic, and those who are, you are more likely to keep at least uh, 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 from time to time, it, it is the gelastic. And I think this is the same thing for all the, the surgical approaches. Now let's look at the behavioral evolution. I, I don't have time to go in each detail, but what you will see is that the majority of our patients were presenting with uh, severe uh, uh, psychiatric comorbidity, the majority was on the side of the rages. Some of them were more on the autistic side. But you see that the, the, the majority of these patients were globally either cured or improved, or more specifically, if you look at heteroaggression rages, you see that more than 50% were completely cured. A third were considered like uh, uh, much improved. Um, you, and what is very interesting is the fact that this is coming very early. And this is a matter of surprise always for me to see that before the, the, the decline of the seizures, you see frequently the improvement of the cognitive aspect and the behavioral aspect, which is difficult to, to, to explain. Maybe an explanation can be that what we see, this is the clinical seizures, and we do know from deep electrode recording that these patients, they have the clinical one, but they have hundreds of not, not visible seizures disturbing the functioning of the brain. And maybe if they, they have these sub, subclinical seizures disappearing first, that may explain an improvement of the cognitive and the, the psychiatric aspects before the true quantitative improvement of reduction of the number of seizures. From the neuropsychological point of view, we have paid a lot of attention to the memory aspect. That's difficult, because when you test memory in a three years old child and in a 20 years old person at the university, that's completely different, of course. And when the, the child you have tested at three years, you have to test at six, nine. This is even more difficult to compare. And when this child have, uh, it rages and cannot follow neuropsychological evaluation, of course, you, you cannot evaluate correctly. So various limitations uh, uh, in all the 
series, but we, we are trying to do our best because we think this is extremely important to have a, a patient who is cured but don't remember what he have done uh, a few minutes before is, is terrible. Uh, if you look at the... We have a group of neuropsychologists now who are working on this, and we will have a specific paper coming with much more detail. I'm not a neuropsychologist, so I'm completely incompetent to, to give you more information. But what I can tell you is that, according to them, we have 13% of our patients who are objectively improving their, their cognitive performances. We, they have found no uh, memory deficit in our population of patients. From the endocrinological point of view, we have a paper in the special issue from our endocrinologists. They have, they have evaluated our material completely independently from us. And they found globally no morbidity, no toxicity. If you look in more detail, you will see that there is one patient with a, a partial TSH decrease, one. And we have <coughs> one patient with a moderate increase of body weight, that's all. But if you look at the population before and after, you see that there is no significant weight gain. And this is another major advantage of radiosurgery, that we don't have significant endocrinological morbidity uh, till now. If you look at the literature, and that's in the paper from Castinetti, you will see that all the other techniques are reporting a significant percentage of patients with endocrinological problems. Um, if you Look at the comparison of the group of patients seizure-free versus non-seizure-free. What you observe is that there is no predictor of uh, uh, success. This is a typical case of a patient who was operated transcalosal interfornicial approach and, and with a remnant and no major improvement and treated by radiosurgery with quite a good result. We, all of us, we all have failures of the others. We are very prone having cured, but they have also our failures. So they are prone being able to cure another way. Um, so globally, the advantage is, is the, the, the tolerance, the, 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 uh, um, the absence of major toxicity. We have some patients with transient poikilothermia, which is not really a complication. We have some patients with transient increase. But the epilepsy is changing also whatever you do. Um, that's difficult to know if that's induced by radiosurgery, but that's what I mean. What is very interesting is the fact that the vast majority of our patients, they don't have MRI changes. So we are not acting through a destructive mechanism. And that may be why the tolerance is better. So that's the price to pay is the delay, but the, the, the benefit is the, the non-destructive effect and the very good tolerance. Of course, Always we have to discuss the fact we are using radiation. This is young population. We have a lot of information in the literature uh, which are indicating that this risk is certainly extremely small, certain, especially compared to the severity of the disease. But this is, uh, I'm at your disposal if you want to discuss more in detail of this aspect. The major issue, I think, in my understanding about this pathology, when we speak about surgery, is the risk of memory decline. And because these lesions are so close from the phonicies and memory bodies, this is extremely difficult by surgical techniques to avoid uh, any injury. Uh, three years ago in Marseille, Anderson, Rosenfeld, uh, Anderson, not Rosenfeld, Anderson was there, Jacqueline Rosel uh, Anderson, she was there, and she was reporting their experience with the transphonicial approach, transcarosol and transphonicial approach, uh, with up to 75% of the patient presenting significant uh, cognitive decline, um, uh, memory decline. And th this is something we cannot uh, escape to, to look at. Uh, the, 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 this approach is also providing a number of endocrinological toxicity, as we have heard. This is also the case for the, for the uh, uh, endoscopic approach, like reported by Dries from uh, Barrows. Um, there is also some, uh, some uh, cognitive impact reported by, by, uh, through endoscopic techniques. And there is a number of both, um, both endocrinological and nesic uh, uh, complications reported by uh, schulz bonange and Ostertag about brachytherapy. So if you look at the literature into, uh, and the different techniques, Unfortunately, the majority of the papers are not reporting in detail the toxicity and especially the cognitive outcome. If you look at the papers where this is reported, there are very few, then you see immediately that radio surgery is turning out to be uh, much better in terms of sparing of the memory, which is quite nicely confirmed by this paper from Barrows where they were looking at the different seas of toxicity of the different uh, approaches. Um, 
we are all of us very enthusiastic about uh, LEAD, and I'm absolutely not an opponent to LEAD. I've just to declare a conflict of interest, which is that w I will have soon the LEAD, and I'm very enthusiastic also to evaluate, and I would like to, to use the same strict methodology prospectively to evaluate. However, um, I think w we have to, ke to keep in mind that when you put the probe in the brain, you have risk. And there is already some papers showing hemorrhages, and there is actually a series of, of papers reporting hemorrhages in the brain. So we, we, we must not, that's our duty as doctors, as neurosurgeons, especially when speaking to patients, to be very clear on, on the fact that uh, a technique with no complication don't exist. As long as you put a probe in the brain, we do know from century of serotactic surgery that we have a risk. Um, the, in terms of, of memory, there is also this uh, case reported yesterday by Dan, which is also demonstrating that you can have, by uh, ablating with, with laser the, the, this kind of lesion, you can have a destructive effect on the mammary bodies with major uh, 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 toxicity on the memory with am complete amnesia in this patient, if I understand correctly. So, I would like to, and this is a general statement, that's not specifically about the laser. I think this is a general problem in, in medicine, in neurosurgery, because I am a neurosurgeon. We, we are fighting difficult disease. We are frequently very enthusiastic when we have something new. And we are creating a peak of inflated expectation from, from the public and from the patient, especially. And then we are facing a phase of disillusionment. And there is a discrepancy between the promised service and the delivered service to the patient. And this is not good. And I think that's our duty to be clear on this. That's our duty to be very cautious on what we are promising. And when we have a new technique, we, have, we know from the past, because we have seen this already hundreds of times, each time we have a new technique, we think the technique is fantastic. As long as you don't have several years, you don't know the toxicity, you don't know the real rate of seizure freedom, and we need several years. And this is the reason why we have done the prospective trial with Gamma Knife, and this is the reason why, as soon as I would have the, 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 the uh, ablative procedure, I intend to do the same thing. That's not that I'm against. I'm just concerned about the effect of promising. So the, the big problem for us, in my understanding, is the, the close relationship to, to the, um, to the uh, uh, memory circuitry, and I think this is the, apparently, till now, the advantage of radio surgery. We are speaking about putting probes for radio frequency thermocoagulation or brachytherapy. Please pay attention to the fact that frequently these lesions are very close, closely related to these very critical structures, which are the mammary bodies and the phonuses. So when you have a lesion turning around, that's very difficult to put a probe such a way, and whatever you put, uh, iodine or you, you you coagulate with radio frequency or you, you make it uh, with a laser, that's very difficult to circumnavigate uh, this structure, sparing the, the, the memory. And this is something you can do with radio surgery because you can plan and you can adapt to the complexity of the 3D shape of the target. Um, of course, this is not for all the, the, the lesions. This is clearly not a front for radio surgery. This is, I think, for radio surgery. And yesterday in the audience, one of these cases was shown, and quite everybody, and especially the doctors, were saying I will go for radio surgery, which was not a surprise. Um, of course, we have to take into account, again, uh, the, the, the anatomy. Those who are in the hypothalamus, I'm speaking under your control, uh, I don't think they are a very good candidate for endoscopy because that's very difficult to know where is the limit. Uh, these you, so that's a very good case for, for radio surgery. These are very good candidate for radio surgery, but can be a very good candidate for endoscopy too, I think. Uh, if they are the same but bigger, you can also discuss the transfornicial, even if that's a second line choice, uh, because we, we know the risks are higher. Uh, we, you have those who are in the floor, uh, which, which are, because of their very close relationship to, to the critical structures, uh, good indication for radio surgery. But these one are clearly not good indication for radio surgery. I think that's important to, 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 to be very clear on this. Um, I don't have time to, to go in detail, but these, the, I think that's extremely important to, to classify anatomically properly because these different kind of location correspond to different level of severity, uh, uh, kind of clinical expression, and str uh, uh, surgical strategies. Um, I think such a lesion is very difficult to approach through a probe, whatever you want to do with your probe. 
Um, this is clearly not an indication for radio surgery. What we do in Marseille is to do first a, a disconnection, and then we intend to do by radio surgery the upper part, which is usually small enough for, for radio surgery. Um, this is a case operated by Delalande. He performed a disconnection, and that was a failure. And the patient, he was proposed a second disconnection. He refused, and we performed radio surgery, and we were lucky enough to have a good result in this case. This is typically not an indication for radio surgery. This guy f was coming from Chile, and he, he was very young, six months, and uh, he, he was really presenting with a catastrophic uh, 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 epilepsy with a lot of seizures, and, and Didier Scavarda operated him in emergency. Partially, but uh, saving the, the situation for a while, some month after he restarted to seize, and then we treated the remnant by radio surgery. So I think, like said by Marc Levier yesterday, there is room for combined approaches. There is no magic approach. At a certain moment, for a certain patient, for a certain anatomy of, of anatoma and certain clinical presentation and severity, uh, there is a rational to start with something, but maybe we have a, a backup of another approach. Or we can immediately combine uh, inten intentionally a, a, a planned a partial resection followed by something else. I told you already that 62% of our patients, they will have two radio surgery, state radio surgery. I explain you why. And you, that's very safe. We, we don't have more complications in this group. And this is very efficient as long as the first one was effective. When I have a patient, I do a first radio surgery, and I don't have efficacy. For me, this, this is a warning. This means that maybe the hypothesis that everything was coming from the hematoma was wrong, and we start to rethink from an epileptological point of view, electroclinical point of view, how much there is a rational or not to to have alternative hypotheses of uh, secondary epileptogenesis or something like this, and maybe uh, more uh, investigation. But if the first radio surgery was effective with a major reduction but not seizure cessation, then, and the tumor, the tumor, the, the hematoma is small enough, we speak about a second stage. So this is two cases. One of the first cases we treated in Marseille, that's a typical gelastic and dacristic seizure. So she's three years old. And she's presenting hundreds of gelastics and dacrystic seizures. She's smiling, she's crying, she's smiling, she's crying permanently. And she's still quite well from a cognitive point of view. Um, so I'll make a long story, sh uh, long story short. This patient was presenting with hundreds of seizures a day. And she got radio surgery with some months that we observed a major decrease of the frequency of the seizures, but she was not completely seizure-free. And we, we discussed with the family, and finally we performed a second radio surgery, and then she became uh, uh, seizure-free. This is another very interesting case. She was from New Zealand, and uh, she started really to seize, she was diagnosed at the age of 11, with very, very severe course, with rages, she, she stopped to speak, she stopped to be continent, she, she was awful, extremely aggressive. The mother told me that when they tried to take the airplane from New Zealand, they were close to resign because they were unable to manage her in the airplane, and they were very grateful to hostess taking her in a different part of the airplane, managing the, the child. And she, she got radio surgery in December 2003, first gamma knife. She started to improve quite rapidly, and a few weeks after, when they came back uh, in New Zealand, she was behaving already better, she, uh, according to the mother. The first, symptom, the first benefit was the, 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 the fact that she restarted to speak, uh, the disappearance of the uh, heteroaggressivity, the rages, and in August 2008, uh, the, the seizures have reduced dramatically, and she stopped valproate, and she got a second radio surgery in 2006, and she has been seizure-free since 2007, and she's still under monotherapy. So that's a very impressive case. Uh, so we know that all these hematoma are not the, the only uh, uh, location of the epileptic zone. Th this is making uh, uh, some of these patients more difficult to treat, and I think we have in common together to work. We have heard about the resting state. We are doing some work on the detection of abnormalities in the brain of these patients. Uh, the conclusion is that uh, after close to 20 years now of experience of radio surgery in this group of patients, we and and the prospective trial, which is actually again the only prospective trial of the literature about the surgical technique for HH, um, we think that it is 
a remarkable safe and efficient technique for the small one, the stage one, two, or three. Uh, the earlier we do it, the better it is in terms of capacity to reverse the epileptic encephalopathy. Um, this is an opportunity for those who have small lesions, but when the lesion is large, we have to think about combined approaches, and uh, all the other techniques have a room, um, and again, we will see in the future what room we will leave to, to the, the uh, uh, laser ablation. Um, very, very is another uh, important point, which is, again, that I think that's important to stop to speak only in terms of seizure cessation. I think to, to address the, the, the issue of efficacy also, or maybe firstly, uh, in terms of uh, psychiatric and cognitive comorbidity is extremely important. So I took back the, the, the table from, uh, from Simon. Um, I think it is clearly established nowadays that's the least invasive in terms of safety. That's, that's a remarkable technique. I do think we, we don't have significant differences in terms of efficacy. That, that's not possible to say because we don't have a comparative trial. Frequently, we are tr treating smaller lesion. In adversaries, you have more large lesions. Uh, however, you have some of these techniques reporting much better results, but usually that's short term. And when you look at the long term, you, you go back to the 60, 65% of angle one or two. Thank you for your attention. Question. Yeah. Probably a very stupid question. No. Is it um, a pretty standard dose of what you apply? No. I'm just thinking other centres do it, and I'm just not sure whether you all use the same protocol. So, what sort of dose type regime do you use? Okay. Uh, we have data from experimental models. Yeah. Uh, models, animal models of epilepsy, showing that the there is a threshold of efficacy which is around 20. We have experience in MTLE patients where we have evidence that 20, 24 gray is the, 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 the first hole of efficacy. And there is a paper from uh, Nick Barrow comparing prospectively 20 to 24, demonstrating 24 was better. Um, when we treated amatomas initially, uh, from, based on the retrospective study, we have seen in this group of patients published in 2000 that all the patients treated with less than 17 were enough failures. Only those with more than 17 were good results. And because of the location, and because I was a little bit scared about the environment, I was not starting at 24. I was starting more at 17, which was, according to this paper, the first rule of efficacy for hematoma. But what is quite obvious when I look at my data is that when we can do it, if we can be a little bit more aggressive, that's better. So nowadays, what I'm doing is on, based on the high-resolution MRI to plan my, my radio surgery, to look at the dose I'm delivering to the memory body, to the phonics, and, and according to this information, I see where I can go in terms of, of dose. And if I can go up as, uh, as high as 20 gray, I do it. So that's not really standard. But okay. I know some centers believe they can be efficient with lower dose. I think they have a lot of failures, <laughs> not surprisingly. Well, that's, I'd, I'll be honest, I think that's probably my experience, which yeah, yeah, is why yeah. I wonder about the dose. And if you do a second one, you give the same dose? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there is also another thing, which is uh, I've discussed with people who are using CyberKnife and Linux, and uh, this is not the scope of this presentation, but frequently they are a little bit more scared about toxicity because they have more low dose around the target, so they prescribe low, lower dose, and frequently they have more failures. I got a discussion with your colleague yesterday about this. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Done. That was a great talk, and I know you didn't have time to go into the details, but what I was wondering about was how many of your patients in that series were post-resection failures? Um, and when you encounter these post-resection failures, or even maybe an ablation failure made it over to you, uh, is it more challenging from the point of view of safety to design the approach on those failures? Okay. Um, that's a very interesting question, of course. We do, <laughs> I don't have in mind the precise percentage. I think that's, that's in one of my table, I think that's around 20, that's between 20 and 30 of our patients who got some surgery before. F different techniques. Um, that's technically more, more challenging, 
But in the slide, I've shown the, the, the statistics between the seizure-free and the non-seizure-free. One of the parameters was previous operation. And that was not turning out to be a predictor. So apparently, even if that's technically more challenging, we, we, we manage it. And, and that's not a predictor of failure for radio surgery. But there is a certain number of patients who are referred to me as failures of surgery who still have big lesions. I'm just re refusing for, for radio surgery and will propose a second stage uh, microsurgical approach. Um, in one of the slides, I may have misunderstood this. Uh, one of the slides is showed uh, more than 90% don't have any MRI changes. Yeah, uh, correct. Surgery. Yep. Does that mean there is no change in the size yep. of the uh, tumor after yep. treatment? It's exactly the same as before treatment. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's a major point. Because nowadays we have a lot of ways to do it, I think that's not making radio surgery superior. That's just making it different. And we have to integrate this information in our thinking about the role of each of the technique. What is clear is that we are not applying a physical uh, uh, aggression. We are not burning. We are not uh, 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 heating. We are not uh, uh, cutting. We are creating a biological delayed response with the negative thing, which is that the effect is delayed. Uh, the positive thing is that this is not a destructive action because the vast majority have no MRI, MRI changes, even not transient titusinal. I'm, I'm not speaking about changing the size. Even the majority of these patients, we do MRI every six months, they don't have a transient T2 change, which is very strange. We, we have experimental models of epilepsy treated by radiosurgery. Uh, uh, sacrificed after cure of the epilepsy and when the, the team in Charlottesville had looked at the animals, they found no, no necrosis. They, they are finding some, some histological things, but they don't have a necrosis. You don't have a necrotic effect, which is explaining that you don't have MRI, uh, uh, morphological MRI. Maybe with more fine MRIs we can see something. But that, that's, that's an important part of, of the what is radio surgery. Yes, you're right. Do we know how it works then? I mean, what, what's the reason? Okay, so there is, there is a lot of works about the radiobiology of radio surgery. We do know that we are creating DNA breakage. And this DNA breakage is leading, when, when cells are entering mitosis, they are failing mitosis and dying. That's what we call apoptosis. So this is the cell-killing me me uh, uh, mechanism of action of radio surgery. Then we can have, in some pathology, certainly less in this group of patients, vascular effect. That's more in AVM or very uh, um, rich uh, uh, tumors in vessels. We have an immune effect, uh, which is well demonstrated now, which is interesting, more important for, for metastatic lesions. Uh, but the major effect is the apoptosis here. And animal models have shown that when you use this range of dose, you see very few neurons uh, dying, but you see a lot of washout of the astrocyte, which is not surprising because they are renewing and they fail their mitosis. And so you have more washout of the astrocytes. And there is papers demonstrating that the, the astrocytes are changing phenotype uh, uh, when they renew after radio surgery. That, that's part of the answer to your question. Can I ask a question? So you said small, um, you, you tackle the small what size, what size do you regard as...? Uh, usually that's not a question of centimeters. That's more a question of a relationship to the structures. Um, I was saying yesterday that when a tumor, a tumor, that's not a tumor, when an hematoma is in the hypothalamus or in the hypothalamus, the floor and the fur, that's usually small enough. The one shown by Simon was a little bit at the limit. That's one of these rare cases which is in the fur but start to be a little bit at the limit. So, so you can keep in mind a tumor, a, an hematoma which is only in the third or in the hypothalamus or in the floor is usually small enough for radio surgery. And the ones hanging down below, the tight ones from the De La Land? What? The, the, the tight ones, yes. the De La Land tight ones. That I don't know. Down. I'm not using the I know specification. Not, but, uh, so I don't know. The, what is the, 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 ones the tight one? That's the tight Oh, that's under the floor. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do rarely. Uh, yeah. First of all, usually these ones, when they are really uh, uh, sessile, 
And, uh, no, pedunculate, they are usually not epileptic. No. So if they are epileptic, this means that there is an, another part of the hematoma which is in the hypothalamus, and that's very misleading. Uh, when they are cecile, um, they can be big, and we are disconnecting first. If they are small, but we don't have a lot, as you have seen, you can treat, there is no problem. But, but they are, in my experience, they are more likely to be bigger. Mm, okay. I have not seen a lot of these ones being cecile and small enough for radiosurgery. 